Welcome to the Sloth Investor Podcast with your host, Mr. Sloth. And welcome to the third episode of the Sloth Investor Podcast, an investing podcast that will help you discover why I believe the humble sloth is the best animal to characterize successful investing. Join me as I discuss my investment philosophy, my five bedrock principles. Last week, we discussed low fees, the second bedrock principle of the sloth investor. And this week, it's the turn of owning the world, my third bedrock principle. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Jay. Jay, how are you? I'm doing fabulous. Thanks for having me on your show again. And if you're just tuning in for the first time, you need to know the discrepancy between sloth and sloth. They're the same animal, just depending on where you come from. It all comes down to the pronunciation, but they're the same creature. Absolutely, Jay. You know, it's so interesting. It really is interesting. I mean, I was listening to a documentary just a few days ago. I did a little bit of dig- digging into this myself, some research, and I heard some Brits pronounce it sloth, some sloth. So even I'm undecided now, Jay. You know, <laughs> subsequent to our previous conversations in episode one and two, even I'm undecided. But I'm going with sloth, but hey, I'm open-minded to sloth or sloth. Whatever takes your fancy, it's fine by me. Okay, so let's get back to the, the topic where... <laughs> We're talking about today about owning the world. Tell me more. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jay. So um, owning the world relates to owning companies from around the world. So the reason for this diversification is that we need to quite simply recognize the fact that great companies exist all over the world. And we want our investment portfolios to capture the growth that's taken place in regions such as Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Africa, and so on. And uh, I've just been rereading a great book on investing by Daniel Crosby, and it's called The Behavioral Investor. Okay, And Crosby makes a great point about investing globally in the book. In fact, I'll quote him now. Begin quote. We would all be wise to recognize that industriousness, industriousness and ingenuity are not the purview of any one place and invest accordingly. End quote. Okay, so it seems obvious that, of course, there's innovative, high quality companies in every corner of the globe and that we should invest our money accordingly. After all, no one region has a monopoly on innovation, which therefore means that this should be a key consideration for how you allocate your investments. You know, and this is really interesting because I think probably one of the shortcomings for some investors is that they fail to recognize the importance of globally diversifying their portfolio. Uh, As a Canadian, I can tell you that there's probably some home bias uh, from Canadians that they're they're, they're tending to look at Canadian stocks and Canadian companies. Can we, do you mind if we look a little bit deeper with the listeners into what a home bias might be and how we can be a little bit more better globally diversified? Mm, Sure, that's a really good point, Chase. So As you quite rightly mentioned, the mistake that many investors make is to favor investing in companies in their home country, otherwise known as home bias. So, you know, let's take the example of a British investor. We could call him Patriotic Pete. Okay, so it's still not uncommon for a significant number of British investors like Patriotic Pete to invest most, if not all, of their equity portfolio in British stocks. So this is despite the fact that the UK stock market only represents roughly four to five percent of the global stock market. Okay, so this mistake though isn't just committed by Brits. So in preparing for this episode, I read a 2017 paper by the Vanguard Investment Group entitled The Global Case for Strategic Asset Allocation and an Examination of Home Bias. Try saying that five times in a row. (laughs) (laughs) So so in the paper, Vanguard reported that on average, Australian investors allocated 67% of their portfolios to their domestic stock market. Okay, so this is despite the fact that the Australian stock market only represents around two to 3% of the global stock market. So So the the entire stock market, uh, Australia only makes up two to 3% of that. Absolutely, that's right, Jay. And yet you're finding that so, so many Australians aren't cognizant of that, or if they are, they're really not reflecting it in their own equity portfolio, okay? They're they're allocating so much of their portfolio to their home 
domestic market. Okay, so I won't run through all the stats now for various other countries, but I can tell you that uh, it's a similar case for, for Canadians as well. So I'm not surprised by that Canadians. I, that I've talked to are doing the same same kind of they're in that they're in that mindset. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, I've got some friends back home, some Brits who are, who you know who have also made that mistake of really favoring their home market to come into home market bias. Okay, so for for me, really, instead of favoring a home bias, having a broad, globally diversified portfolio means that you're capturing the growth that's taking place in the emerging economies of Southeast Asia, South America, and other regions of the world. Okay, um, the Vanguard in Investment Group makes this point in a 2019 research paper. So they state, begin quote. Another benefit of global diversification is the opportunity to, to participate in whichever regional market is outperforming. For example, while the United States may lead over some periods, another country or region will invariably lead at other points, end quote. So in this episode, we're going to discuss a selection of companies from around the world that appear interesting, particularly from the point of view of growth. Okay, so this kind of we're getting down to some really good meat and potatoes now the, the sort of the how do we really get into some investing and talking about some specific companies but if you're a newbie investor and you don't want to spend a lot of time doing the research and you don't even know where to begin and how to do the research uh they want to be hands off mm. and I, I, don't, I don't i'm i'm gonna say uh, for a, a lot of the times i'm i'm hands off i want to i want to not have to worry about it. I want to have to do the research. I want to be more like uh, a couch potato. Then some might call it an ultra sloth or ultra sloth. You're right. So absolutely. I mean, I've got several friends back home. I've got several friends here I am now who really, really want to be so hands off and couch potato like, like you say, and they don't want to really commit the time to kind of research individual companies. They want to make things as carefree, as hassle-free as possible. So they want to invest, their, they want to grow their hard-earned savings, but they haven't got the time and perhaps even the required degree of interest to research individual stocks. So what they desire is simplicity, the first bedrock principle of the sloth investor. Okay, so what these people really need to know is that they can invest globally using simplicity. We discussed the idea of low fee last week, right? So we want people to be able to invest globally, but do it in a simple way, but also be low fee. That sounds like a trifecta. Can you shed a little more light on for our listeners what the trifecta is and what it might look like for them? Yeah, absolutely, Jay. So um, a phrase that I've developed before is the investor trifecta. So let me shed a little more light on that now. So um, yeah, you did a great job there. Shine a spotlight on those three bedrock principles. Okay, so they are, of course, the first three bedrock principles of the sloth investor. Simplicity, low fees, and owning the world. So for the hands-off investor looking to make investing as simple as possible, I refer to these three principles collectively as the sloth investor trifecta. And in a moment, I'll explain how investors can keep things ever so simple by buying a simple, low fee, globally diversified fund, i.e., for example, a low fee ETF fund that enables them to quite simply own the world. So let me repeat those three bedrock principles again, simplicity, low fees, and owning the world. If you're really looking to keep things as simple as possible and want to commit little time towards investing, then this trifecta of principles, simplicity, low fees, and owning the world, really does provide newbie investors with a common sense cocktail, a hands-off couch potato portfolio that, that, can, that can help them succeed within the domain of investing. And you know, in fact, something I've noticed about that phrase, Jay, is this, sloth investor trivector. Sloth investor trifecta, it's pretty instructional because each letter from that phrase spells out the word sit. And this helps to explain what investors should do with a simple low fee globally diversified fund. Sit on a fund for years and years and years, decades in fact. 
And that's a, a great visualization. The, the word couch potato or, or a sit investment strategy, couch potato coined by Andrew Helen, which means you can sit on the couch and do absolutely nothing, sit back and just enjoy your investments. And the analogy using sit, uh, the acronym sit, you know, you're, you're absolutely having taking a, almost a hands-off approach. You're recognizing the importance of investment, but you're able to step back and not have to worry about the research that's necessary to invest in a, one, in particular, one particular company. Can you talk to me a little bit more about owning the world in a simple, low-fee way? Because there's people out there who don't know how to do that. Mm, mm. And that's a really, really great question, which I can dig into now. So... Uh, let's take the example of a Brit. Okay, so a British investor can purchase a low fee, globally diversified ETF from Vanguard. Okay, the Vanguard Investment Group. So let me now give an example. So there's a fund available on the London Stock Exchange, and it's named the FTSE All World ETF. And the ticker symbol is VWRL. Again, it's VWRL. And this fund contains over three and a half thousand companies from around the world from both developed and developing countries okay those emerging markets that i spoke about before so the fee is low at 0.22 percent which is a notable customary feature of vanguard's funds okay they're known for their low fee etfs index funds also generally speaking the funds country allocation will correlate to a country's percentage representation of the global stock markets. Let me explain a little bit more about that. So yeah, because that's, that's yeah, I, I need I need a little bit more information on that. Heavy term. So earlier I mentioned that the UK stock market accounts for around about four to five percent of the global stock market, and this fund, okay, the FTSE All World ETF ticker symbol VWRL, it has a four percent exposure to UK. So if we take the US, the US stock market represents roughly around about 55% of the global stock market. And subsequently, when we take a look at this fund, we can see that it has a 57% exposure to the US stock market. Okay, so the beauty of a fund such as this is the degree of diversification that it provides. So if we consider that there are three options for how an investor could choose to invest this their money in the stock market, they each begin with the letter S. We can think about stocks, we can think about sectors, i.e. the finance sector, sector, the tech sector, industrials, utilities, and so on. And the final S, states. And by that, I mean nation states, or you might say country. So stocks, sectors, and states. Okay, so a fund such as this provides diversification across stocks and sectors and nation states. So not only is the fund broadly diversified in a geographic sense, you also get diversification across sectors such as technology, healthcare, financials, telecommunications, utilities, and so on. And this is, you bring up some really strong points here too. Myself being included, a newbie investor. They want to get exposure. They want to have an opportunity to invest in some, we call them blue chip companies, but these are big companies that are quite rich and quite powerful in the market. People want to, uh, you might, when I think of that, I think of companies like they, they call it um, Fang, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, and I might add a company like Microsoft to that list. If you want exposure to them, if you want to in part own them, can you talk a little bit more about new, for newbie investors, what would that look like? Yeah, that's a great question, Jay. So when I speak to some of my close friends and colleagues who are just beginning their investing journey, they're really, really curious to know, well, how can I get invested in these companies, the great 21st century tech blue chips, such as those that you mentioned, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, etc. So it is pretty easy to get this information. So if you simply want to know the top 10 holdings, you could Google the ticker symbol for the fund that you're interested in. So I spoke just a moment ago about VWRL. Okay, so what I can simply do, I could go to Google, type in VWRL, followed by the words fact sheet. Okay, and in the search results, you'll then be able to click on a fact sheet document that contains information concerning the top 10 holdings. So. When I looked at the fact sheet for the FTSE All World Fund, ticker symbol VWRL, 
I can see in the top 10 holdings, some of the major blue chip companies of today, like you mentioned, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Tesla. So in addition, the fact sheet also provides information about the fees, their geographic allocation, their sector allocation, and the performance of this fund. You mentioned performance. I guess I got a two-part question here because then this goes into sort of an A and a B. For someone who's new, what do you mean by company performance? And then what's the performance of these kind of, or the, this fund right here in this, and full, full disclosure, I, I'm an owner of VWRL myself. And can you talk a little bit more about the performance of this type of fund or funds like this that are, might be uh, located elsewhere around the world? Sure, yeah. So historically, Jay, the, um, the return of the stock market over time has been around about in the 8 to 10% ballpark area, okay? So you would expect if you're looking at historical um, record of a fund such as this, okay, you would be expecting to see, roughly speaking, a return in that region, okay? So... That return is made up of an aggregate of all of the companies that are contained within this fund, okay? So performance is important. So you do want to check out the performance. And one thing you do have to note is that, um, you know, the performance will vary year upon year upon year. So some years it might be lower, mm. uh, even of be lower than where it started, you know, earlier yeah. in the year. And then the next year it might go up a little bit. And then the next year it might go up a lot and then down a little bit from where it currently is. So that I guess what's important for me to keep in mind, and I think for newbie investors, and I, what, what I struggled to come to grips with was the fact that, yes, it may go down one year, but, and it might go up a lot one year, but on average, I can expect a return of about 8 to 10% in a normal average year over the course of many, many, many years. Absolutely, Jay. So this fund started in May 2012, which is just over nine years ago. And in that time, it's returned an average of 10.1% a year to investors, which really isn't too shabby, okay? It's pretty good indeed. Um, so yeah, if we take a look at perhaps the last five calendar years as, in, as an example, so like you quite rightly say, one year, you're gonna get a really great return. The next year, maybe not so much. The following year, it might be that ret the return is negative. It doesn't perform so well. So let's take the last five calendar years as an example. So if we start 20, it was 2016, we can see that the VWRL fund returned 6%. In 2017, it was 22%. In 2018, the return was minus 11%. In 2019, the return was 24%. And in 2020, the return was 14%. So we can see that despite the average return of this fund being just over 10% over the last nine years, in not one of the last five years did the fund actually return this amount. In fact, I looked at the full years for every period since the fund started, okay? So, was it now, since 2012, I looked for every calendar year since that, uh, since the inception date, the start date, and in not one year did the fund actually return between eight to 10%. Okay, so you're going to see that variety of returns with it, a fund like that. And I think it's important to note that you're advocating for long-term investments. You're advocating for people who aren't in it for a half a year, people who aren't in it for a year or even a year and a half. We're talking um, performance over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Can you talk a bit more about this fund performance and how it's performed this in the short term, this, this last half year, let's say, for example. So it's really important for investors to recognize the variability of these returns. So yes, on the one hand, the average annual return of the stock market has been between 8 to 10%, but more often than not, you're going to get figures way out of this range, even much higher, and of course, sometimes lower too. So I know we're long-term investors, and we wouldn't normally discuss half-year returns, but we can even see that the fund has returned 12% this year. Okay, so despite the volatility we've seen, despite the fact that there's been some mayhem and um, much degree of consternation with regards to tech stocks and volatility there, despite all of those things, okay, and topsy-turvy nature of the market so far this year in 2021, 
Interestingly, the fund is still up 12% this year. So the important thing here to recognize is that today's investors have access to a variety of low fee, globally diversified ETFs that not only give you access to major blue chip companies, but also developed countries as well. And if that's where you want your exposure, that you have that opportunity. And this is the same thing if you're living in the UK, if you're a Canadian, if you're living in South Africa, if you're living in Hong Kong, you actually have access to invest in low fee, broadly diversified ETFs. Mm, that's right, Jay. It's like that Jack Bogle phrase that I mentioned in our first episode. Don't look for the needle by the haystack. I've heard you say that before. I think that's actually some really great advice. Uh, don't look for the needle by the haystack. And this is particularly important, I think, for investors that really want or require a hands-off approach to investing. I'm a little bit intrigued though. Uh, what if there's another investor, someone who's committed to the five bedrock principles and they're willing to dig a little bit deeper and look for a, a single company uh, that they might hope is their, their gem, their, their next Amazon, their next, their next Microsoft. What advice would you have for them? Yeah. So that's a great point, Jay. So, um, you know, that leads us really into the second segment of today's show. And we're going to explore a selection of great international companies that you and I are familiar with. And um, just in terms of advice, you mentioned advice. What I'm going to do as I go through, I'm going to talk about how it was that, you know, I discovered these companies, some friends did, and um, the ways that other people as well can kind of dig a little bit deeper and kind of discover these companies. So I'll give some insights about that. So, um, but this is great though, because I know I know there is a lot of great companies that you, you and I have had discussions about great companies in 2021 that I think that people would do well to know about. Um, one of the things I dip, I struggle with sometimes though, it's a bit overwhelming. And you've given me some tips and some advice on how I can structure this and how I can manage this. Mm. Can you pass that on a little bit of what you know? I think that'd be really helpful to the listeners. Yes. Yeah, so this could get really overwhelming in terms of just how many great international companies there are. There are just dozens and dozens, so many great international companies out there. So I've been thinking a little bit about how we could structure this. Okay. So we could be literally here for hours talking about, about these companies. So go. It's a so, short podcast. We can't go for hours. I know. I know. So here's the suggestion. Why don't we take, why don't we take for now two continents? We'll do a deep dive on one of the companies from each of those continents, each of those regions, and then we'll briefly mention some of the other notable continents, sorry, notable companies, I should say, or honorable mentions from these regions. So you're going to give us the names of specific companies that you've been researching and that you like. Yeah, for sure. I'll do a deep dive on a company in Asia. I'll do a deep dive on a company in Europe, going into quite a bit of detail. And then I'll give some honorable mentions for some companies in those regions too. That sounds like a plan to me. Let's start with Asia because you and I are in Asia. Absolutely, Jay. Absolutely. Okay. Let's start with Asia. Okay. Listeners, are you ready? He's going to tell you, he's going to give you a tip uh, on something. He's been researching a company that he likes and that he has found to be something maybe that you might want to investigate a bit further. Go ahead, Mr. Sloth, please. Thanks a lot, Jay. Okay, so my first company is C Limited. So the ticker symbol is SE, and this company's stock is available to buy on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, so C Limited is a leading global consumer internet company founded in Singapore. The name of the company is a nod to Southeast Asia, the company's main market. The company's mission is to better the lives of consumers and small businesses with technology. And the company operates three core businesses. The first is e-commerce. The second is digital payments and financial services. And the third is digital entertainment or what we, we might call Jay, gaming. Okay, so let's discuss e-commerce first. C Limited operates Shopee, and Shopee is the largest e-commerce platform in Southeast Asia and Taiwan. Now, we could spend a whole podcast just talking about the growth of Shopee across Southeast Asia, but I want to really zero in on the company's growth in Indonesia, given the population of that country is around about 276 million people. So just recently, Shopee has now pulled ahead of Tokopedia, which is an Indonesian technology company specializing in e-commerce. 
Shopee's monthly web visits in Indonesia are greater than Tokopedia and their gross merchandise value is also greater. Okay, can you, for the listeners and for myself, can you explain a little bit about what gross merchandise value is? That's a really good point. Okay, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. It's quite a tricky one, isn't it? Try and say that three times real fast. <laughs> I like it, Jay. I like it. Okay, so yeah, so gross merchandise value, sometimes referred to as GMV, is basically the total value of merchandise sold over a given period of time. Now, this company, SE, yep. during your research, you stumbled upon, I think you came across, and I'm trying to recall them offhand, I can't, but you came across some amazing growth stat for e-commerce in Indonesia, which you think relates well to why you would recommend SE. Absolutely. I mean, C Limited, SE, the ticker symbol, it is a Singaporean com uh, company. But the growth prospects in Indonesia is what really fascinates me in particular. Okay. So in just four years, the share of e commerce in Indonesia has increased from just 2% in 2016 to 20% 20 of retail sales in 2020. And if we take the broader region as a whole, Online retail in Southeast Asia is expected to grow from 19 billion US dollars in 2018 to 53 billion US dollars by 2023. Yeah, I was like, okay, so you mentioned e commerce, but then you said that there's two other businesses that C Limited operates. Again, you've talked about the, the e commerce. You said another one when I, I wrote it down here in my notes was digital payments and financial services, and another one was what we would call gaming. Absolutely, Jay. A little bit of gaming. So, so that's right. So the digital financial services arm of C Limited is known as C Money. C Money. Okay. So C Money incorporates a whole suite of services, but for the sake of brevity, I'll just mention C Money's mobile wallets. Okay, which are Shopee Pay and AirPay. Okay. So these mobile wallets provide users with easy access to digital payment services. They allow users to make online payments top up with their wallet, transfer and withdraw funds, and make payments offline at thousands of merchant partner locations, okay? Providing these users with a pretty seamless shopping experience. And the impressive thing for me is that Shopee Pay is currently in use in Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnamese, Vietnam, I should say, sorry, and the Philippines, okay? So now just a little bit of information on AirPay. AirPay was introduced in- Not to be confused with AirPlay, uh, AirPay. Don't be confused with that guy. So AirPay was introduced in 2014, okay? So consumers can use their AirPay app as an e-wallet to pay for products and services. Okay, so tell our listeners a little bit more about the gaming arm of C Limited, SE. Mm, it seems like things never stop for C Limited, okay? They've uh, got very broad business interests. So. Garena is the name of C-Limited's online games developer and publisher. So it has a global footprint across more than 130 markets, okay? So Garena is the developer and publisher of Free Fire, a popular mobile battle royale game. So Free Fire was the most downloaded mobile game globally in 2019 and 2020. It was also the highest grossing mobile game in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and India in 2020. Those are impressive numbers. I have to admit that I'm not an owner of SE, but after hearing what you had to say about them, <laughs> I think that <laughs> the first thing I'm going to do after this podcast is go look them up and see if that's, you know, the next thing I need to be adding to my portfolio. You talked about e-commerce, you talked about digital payments and gaming. It's a, actually a pretty broad, but impressive list. During your research, I know you, you, and it, my, probably one of my regrets is you mentioned SE to me um, months ago. And when you mentioned to me months ago, you had a quote about them and, and they've gone up since then. Can you tell me more about the quote that you came across when it comes to this company? Yeah, thanks, Jay. So I've got a really intriguing quote here from Nick Nash. Okay, so Nick Nash is an American who is the former group president of C from 2014 to 2018. And he comments on the fact that Forrest Lee, the co-founder of C Limited, had a plan to create a company that was inspired by Alibaba and Tencent, but for the Southeast Asian market. So I'll quote him now, begin quote. 
Southeast Asia's evolution is in many respects similar to China, but happening about 11 years later. The brilliance of Forrest's strategy was very clear, an opportunity to locally adapt and be inspired by the two most valuable business models from China, online games from Tencent and e-commerce from Alibaba, end quote. So I'll dig a little deeper into Forrest Lee, C's co-founder, and I found him to be a really interesting individual. So while growing up, he used to spend most nights playing video games and internet cafe, a habit he continued partly to escape to escape the dullness of his first career. He was a recruiter in Shanghai for Western companies. And after around about four years of that, Lee realized he wanted to do something different with his life. So the first step was getting accepted into Stanford University for an MBA, not bad. And that's where he encountered a formative American role model in Steve Jobs. So Forrest Lee was present when Jobs delivered his famous Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish Stanford graduation speech in 2005. And in fact, he made it his life motto. So Forrest Lee is often referred to as Singapore's Steve Jobs. And you can't see it here, listeners, but I'm shaking my head and it's almost a, a forehead and palm moment because after you're rhyming off all that information, uh, I'm even further in sort of lack of buying remorse that I didn't listen to your advice months ago on this company. Uh, for someone who wants to find out more, myself included, where are we going to go to next? Well, if we want to do a little bit more research, find out some more, dig deeper on SE, what should we do? Yeah, great question, Jay. So I've actually got four Twitter accounts I'd recommend following for anyone that wants to dive a little bit deeper into this particular C. Aha, uh -huh, pun intended. I like it. See what I did there, Jay? <laughs> that was impressive. That was impressive. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Off the uh, off, sort of like off the top of your tongue, nicely played. <laughs> Thank you. Right, okay, I like it. So um, yeah, you know me. You know I can't resist a little bit of wordplay, but what I'll do, I'll go ahead and give our listeners the account. So these are some accounts from FinTwit, okay, financial Twitter, okay, and these are some accounts that really, really will give you great insights into C Limited, okay. So the first is James Booth, and his Twitter handle is at. E-M paradigm shift. So I don't expect you guys to remember that. And what I'm going to do for all of these Twitter handles, I'm going to drop the names of these Twitter handles in the description for this podcast. But E, capital E, capital M, paradigm shift. And interestingly, James's pin tweet is currently a thread on C money. Okay, it's a thread on C money. Okay, so the second account would be Slingshot Capital. His Twitter handle is at Slingshot Cap. So Slingshot is based in Singapore and also based in Singapore. It's the third account to follow. And that is Terence Lee. And his Twitter handle is at Terence Lee JX. And the final account is Max Basenko. Uh, Max's Twitter handle is at Max the Comrade. So again, don't worry, your listeners, about having to remember each and every single one of those Twitter handles. I'm going to drop those names, those Twitter accounts in the uh, description for this podcast. Are there any honorable mentions? You mentioned before that you had something more um, in Asia. Any other honorable mentions, companies that you think would be worth mentioning? Oh my gosh, there are so many. There are so many. But one that springs to the top of my mind that jumps out to me straight away is Taiwan Semiconductors. It's a stock that you and I own. It's been a very successful yes. stock for us, right? We've been very, very, <laughs> very lucky. We, we timed it, seemed to be... I'm lucky with our timing on that one. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a great stock. So the ticker symbol for Taiwan Semiconductors is TSM. And again, this company's stock is available to buy on a New York Stock Exchange. Also, something that speaks to the quality of this company is that it is the only Asian company in the top 10 holdings of the Vanguard VWRL ETF fund that I mentioned earlier. What is the, and for our listeners, can you tell them a little bit more about exactly what does TSM do? Yeah, no problem. So uh, Taiwan Semiconductors, TSM, is significantly ahead of its competitors in understanding how to produce the world's highest performance, performance chips. So it was founded in 1987, and its entire business is devoted to manufacturing semiconductors for others. 
So we think about, you know, our thirst for products that contain semiconductors has worked wonders for the return of the stock. And, you know, I was looking at the historical returns and they were just uh, mind blowing, just incredible. So over the past 10 years, the stock has returned over 815%, which amounts to an average annual return of 25% over this time period. Could- just so our listeners know, that is not normal. That is not normal. That is very not normal. Yeah. Um, but you've got some pretty interesting revenue numbers for this company. Can you tell us more? Yeah, so uh, that's right, Jay. Um, an incredibly impressive stat is that revenue has increased for each of the last 10 calendar years. Okay, so for the sake of brevity, I won't run through each yearly number, but here's a summary. So for the calendar year ending 2011, revenue was 15 and a half billion US dollars. For the calendar year ending 2015, this revenue amount had risen to 30.6 billion US dollars. And for the calendar year ending 2020, the revenue figure for Taiwan semiconductors was 48.6 billion US dollars. Incredible growth. And I would say that, that that's more than you have in your bank account, is it not? Uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've got one more interesting uh, for your honorable mention. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's right, Jay. So um, this is a company that just um, come across my radar recently. Um, I still want to dig a little bit deeper into it, but it's certainly one that really does look ever so interesting. So it's an Israeli company called Global E Online Limited. So the ticker symbol is GLBE, and it's available on the New York Stock Exchange, okay? And I need to send out a shout out to a member of the Thin Twit community for recently dropping some information about this company on Twitter. The person I'm referring to is Canadian and his name is Dylan and his Twitter handle is at Blue Suit Dylan. Okay, he's definitely worth following on Twitter. You said he's Canadian? He's Canadian. If he's Canadian, he's definitely worth following. <laughs> I thought so, Jay. I, could, I thought you'd say that. Um, yeah, be careful with his Twitter handle, though. So it's at Blue Suit Dylan, and it's blue without the letter E. But once again, okay, for the sake of ease and to make things extra nice and easy for you guys, I will drop his Twitter handle in the description for this podcast, okay? So a little bit of information about Global E. So Global E helps around 400 e-commerce merchants and brands like Versace and Hugo Boss easily sell their products around the world by translating websites into local languages and handling shipping, duties, foreign currencies, merchandise returns, and more. Now, full disclosure, like I mentioned, this is a company that the Sloth Investor has done re- very little research into, relatively little research compared to companies that I normally like to kind of buy and, and really dig it deeper into. So I'm at that kind of like really formative stage in terms of understanding the company. Okay, however, this is what Brian Feroldi, a linchpin of FinTwit and a writer for The Motley Fool stated on a Motley Fool industry focus podcast about the company back in March of this year. Okay, begin quote. I think that this has a potential 10 bagger written all over it. I like that the company is in hyper growth mode. I like that they get customers and then keep them for a long period of time. I like the business angle here. I like the opportunity. I like that they're already profitable. There is a lot to like about this business. This is definitely a company that the Sloth investor wants to take a deeper look into. So uh, just for the audience, if you don't know, a 10 bagger means a company that's going to increase tenfold. They in, they're anticipating it will increase tenfold. Absolutely. In stock yeah. value. Absolutely, Jay. So uh, Brian Ferroldi sees GLBE, Global E, as being a company that has amazing growth potential ahead of it. And I think perhaps in a future podcast, we can talk about that whole concept of uh, multi-baggers because it's something that you and I have spoken about before. And I think our listeners would really, really... Um, get a lot of value from that. So um, that's something that we can certainly dig into in future episodes as well. Now, I wonder, is there something in the water in Israel? Because I know you have another Israeli company on your list. Do you want to briefly mention it? Sure. So um, let me start by stating that although this company is headquartered in Israel, its stock is available to buy on the New York Stock Exchange. So the company is called InMode, okay? InMode, and the ticker symbol is I-N-M-D. I-N-M-D. MD. So InMode offers cutting edge medical devices for minimally invasive and non-invasive procedures for patients. Okay, so let me 
dive in a bit more into that. What does that exactly mean? So essentially what this company does is they provide aesthetic treatments for the face and body. Okay, so invasive surgeries, you know, the industry norm, are procedures that cut or puncture the skin by inserting instruments into the body. Well, InMode's product range focuses on minimally invasive, like small incisions and non-invasive surgery methods. So here's an interesting quote from the company's North American president on the company's first quarter 2021 earnings call. Okay, begin quote. The holy grail of plastic and facial surgery is the ability to tighten skin without causing scars. And there's no one that's gone further along that path. We're not there yet, but we're further along than anyone else. End quote. Okay, so according to Grandview Research, the non-invasive market is expected to grow into an $18.5 billion industry by 2028. Okay, so uh, a final few points by InMode. It's already profitable, it has no debt, and since the company went public around about two years ago, it's returned over 500% to investors, which again is pretty incredible. The stock is currently selling for around about $88 per share, and two years ago, it was selling for around about $14 per share. So let me just make one final point, which is to thank a member of Fintwit for introducing me to this stock, to InMode, I-N-M-D. And this person's name is Roy, and his Twitter handle is at invest for decades capital I N V E S T the number four decades. But again, now I will drop his Twitter handle in the description for this podcast episode. So I'm um, just wondering, Jay, uh, do you have any companies in Asia that you think are worthy of an honorable mention? I, I do. And it, I mentioned before, sort of the Fang stocks, the Facebook, the Apple, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, um, mega cap companies that, they have in the US. Well, Asia has some tech uh, titans as well. And I'm an owner of Tencent. I'm an owner of Alibaba, JD, Meituan. Those are sort of my big cap stocks, but I also, I'm an owner of Lenovo and I like Lenovo and I like China Mobile for their dividend payments. Um, and, inclu- and in addition to the opportunity for the, the stock to increase in value. And I want to, also mentioned that I, um, I'm an owner of Ganfeng. It's a stock number 2845. And I think it was you who introduced me to that. And absolutely, absolutely. So um, I own all these in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Yeah, very interesting. So um, yeah, when we think about the growth of the electronic car industry and um, lithium could be a key beneficiary of that. Yeah, Ganfeng Lithium is something that came upon the Slope Investors Radar in early January of this year. And... Um, yeah, a recent dip um, in the last month or so, but again, it's come bouncing back. So uh, Gang Thing Lithium, one of the world's largest producers of lithium, could be a great company to own in the future. It's a stock that you and I own. And um, yeah, thanks for mentioning that one. It's a great stock. And you know what? When it comes time to talk about the importance of remaining a sort of a headstrong, this is the perfect example. We'll, we'll talk more about headstrong in another episode, but this is the perfect example of the importance of remaining headstrong, where my... The value of my stock in Genfeng had gone below what I had originally invested in. But and I thought, oh, do I need to get rid of it? It's down 10, 20%. Maybe it's time to unload it. And because who knows how far it's going to go. And it's come back uh, roaring like gangbusters. And it's done so well lately yeah. that I'm glad that I stick with that advice of remaining headstrong. But we'll talk more about that in another episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Let's, let's go on to Europe. Tell, tell us more. What would you recommend for the people who, the listeners who are in Europe? What would you recommend? Yeah, that's, uh, I think it's an answer about time. Let's move on to Europe. So, you know, we've spoken about e-commerce in Southeast Asia during our discussion about Sea Limited a little early on. So um, let me now talk about the growth of e-commerce in Russia. E-commerce in Russia. This sounds interesting. Sure. I, I don't know a whole lot about it. I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say because I know Russia is a pretty big world player. Oh my goodness. Okay. That land size is utterly gargantuan. Okay. And could potentially lead to some difficulties if you are an e-commerce company, but we'll talk about that in a little while as well. So the company's name is Ozon and the tickle symbol is O-Z-O-N. Okay. O-Z-O-N. Okay. 
and it's available available to buy on a New York stock exchange. The company is a leading e-commerce platform in Russia. So the usage rate for Russian e-commerce is a relatively modest 9%. In China, it's 27%, and in the UK, it's 18%. So we can see that there's potentially plenty of room for growth in Russian commerce. Now, Russia is about the same size, roughly about same land size as Canada. This is an absolutely gargantuan size of a country. Tell Absol- us more about what how how they're going to be able to o- overcome this. Absolutely. I mean, just utterly, utterly gargantuan, like you say. So um, that's why Ozon is investing heavily in their fulfillment and courier network. So I recently read a fascinating Motley Fool article on Ozon, which stated that as of September 2020, the company was able to execute next day delivery for around about 40% of Russia. Not bad, not bad. Uh, but I think that's actually surprising to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I was surprised too by that stat. I really was. So, with the company's increasing investments, I'd expect to see this continuing to rise over time. Okay, so here's some other information on the company, some bullet points, if you like. So, revenue growth for the company has been strong. The first quarter of 2021 showed year on year revenue growth of 67% based on the same period from the previous year. Ozon is looking to diversify geographically. They're looking to launch operations in Belarus. The company's debit card has over 450,000 signups. This is a 690% increase year after year, year over year. And the company also recently acquired Oni Bank. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Oni Bank. So that is enabling it to move into the financial services sector. So the company really does appear to be firing on all cylinders. And I like to send a shout out to two members of the Thin Twit community that are a great source of information on Ozon. So if you've been intrigued and you're curious to know more about this company, follow these guys. Uh, They're pretty good, pretty informative. They like to keep tabs on Ozon. And the first one is Brad Freeman. Brad Freeman, he's a writer for The Motley Fool. His Twitter handle is at StockMarketNerd. Once again, I'll drop his name in the description for the podcast. Here's our Twitter handle. And a second person, I think I mentioned uh, Max Besenko with regards to C-Limited, but Max is also quite an authority on Ozon, okay? So Max Besenko's Twitter handle is at Max the Comrade, at Max the Comrade. Truth be told, I wouldn't have thought Russia to be um, a place for a great business opportunity. Any risks that you think people should be aware of? That's a great point, Jay. So, um, you know, whenever we conduct our due diligence, we always need to look at the kind of geopolitical angle, okay? Particularly when we think about Russia and the kind of uh, that territory. And this is, you know, I, I, truth be told too, uh, the geopolitical um, pitfalls are the same things that I'm struggling with when it comes to my tech giants like Baba, JD, Meituan. Um, I'm feeling the mm-hmm. same thing. So, sorry, I interrupted yeah, you. Tell fine. us more. Yeah, I mean, that that's a really great point. I mean, you know, I think that's something that we could continue to explore as well in discussions about Chinese companies in the future. But but certainly with regards to uh, Ozon, you know, th- there's always a possibility of sanctions. Sanctions in particular are always a possibility, perhaps conflict, who knows? You know, so therefore investors looking to own this company should probably require a strong stomach. Ozon is the main European company that we're focusing on. Is there any others that you would say in Europe that you would give an honorable mention to? Absolutely, Jay. So um, both companies are going to be Dutch. You just said the word both, and they're both Dutch. Double uh, Dutch is my, my is my word play for today. I like it. I like it. Double Dutch, you know, Jay, but I will try my best to make these companies and what they do as clear as possible. So I hope they won't be sounding double Dutch to our followers. Okay, so the first company that I want to mention is ASML. ASML. And this is a truly incredible company. You probably heard my voice raise up there when I mentioned ASMR because this is a company that really excites me. It's a company that I own. And um, the ticker symbol, ASML, again, I'll mention it again. It's available on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. And ASML, what do they do? Well, they've. So ASML has pioneered technology now known as extreme ultraviolet lithography. 
Again, try saying that five times in a row. Okay. <laughs> Extreme ultraviolet lithography. Is, I'm trying to figure out what that is. Right? I know. Oh, yeah. It, um, it's otherwise known as EUV. Okay. So this is an incredibly difficult technology that took 25 years to develop and commercialize. And ASML is the sole owner of the technology today. So I get this, you know, it's beginning to sound a little complex. So I'll try to make things as simple as possible. So essentially, ASML gives the world's leading chip makers the power to mass produce patterns on silicon, helping to make computer chips smaller and faster. And interestingly, ASML's top customer is Taiwan Semiconductors, which can't produce its smallest chips without using ASML's top tier extreme ultraviolet systems, okay? And let's make one final point, ASML, and that's its amazing return over the last decade. That's since. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No. Yeah. Sorry. No. 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 I cut you off. Sorry. Sorry. Say that again. Yeah. Sorry. So let, let me. I miss. I misheard you. I'm trying to. I'm trying to wrap these numbers around my head here. Yeah. So, it's incredible. I mean, I think you you got a glimpse here of um of the return, and uh, these this, this is absolutely true. Since June 2011, the stock has returned over 1,300 percent to investors. Okay, that's an average annual return of 31 percent per year. I just, I, full disclosure, I didn't see that until just now in my paper. And I looked at 1,300% to investors. That's, that's outrageously awesome, amazing. It is incredible, right? Absolutely incredible. It really is. Okay, so the, the, the returns on that company are amazing. They're fantastic. That's a company that you're, you're definitely keeping an eye on and you're recommending our, our listeners keep an eye on. You mentioned Double Dutch, our second co uh, company from Holland. Who's that? Sure, Jay. And um, it's a payment company. And the company's name is Adyen. The ticker symbol for the company on the American exchange is A-D-Y-E-Y. A-D-Y-E-Y. And Adyen operates a global payments platform enabling businesses to process online payments. The company has partnerships with eBay, Foot Locker, and Columbia Sportswear. This is a company that I'm looking to dive deeper into. And this is explains why I'm not going to talk that much about it now. However, I wanted to throw this company out to our listeners as it's a company that's repeatedly come up on my radar during my investment perusals online. So I just want to take a little bit more time to dig deeper into it, but it's a company that I think looks really promising. And of course, there's so much growth within that fintech space, whether it's Square, whether it's Adyen. This is an industry that I think uh, is likely to continue to grow ever so much over the next decade. Well, that wraps up our episode for today. That was actually what I loved about today was you actually not only gave some investment advice, but you actually came to the table with some companies that you want our listeners to keep an eye on. Absolutely, Jay. Absolutely. Okay. Owning the world. Don't succumb to home bias. Remember to have that diversified portfolio and uh, stay the course. Our focus next week will be on the fourth bedrock principle, which is time. So, so, so important. And I'm looking forward to episode four and our focus on time. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you are just hearing the podcast for the first time, tune in to follow Mr. Sloth at, on Twitter at Sloth underscore investor. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. See you guys. Thank you. More tips and ideas, follow the Sloth underscore investor on Twitter.